I was just reading an article this morning. I found this wonderful uh, cartoon uh, that when you talk about industry 4.0, factory of the future, uh, there's a lot of change and cultural change required within the organization. Setting ourselves, making ourselves siloed doesn't help, right? So uh, it is a hard thing, but can be done because uh, most of the research uh, which we see, and even uh, this is a very complex sounding slide, you might see uh, there's a functional team, the team who is on the ground, where there is a production floor team, where there's a quality team, where there's inventory team, they are the one who will be driving these changes. At the same time, we have the CXO team who are strategizing this approach. Where things goes wrong, if I can say, or doesn't proceed well is when things always remain in the boardroom, the CXO, and doesn't get transferred to the functional team. So uh, just to explain quickly on this slide is basically we in the process of implementation of this journey of factory of the future, we need to hand over the power. We need to hand over this, this uh, the 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 responsibility to the functional team, and that's what the change will happen. The CXOs, the CDOs, the CIOTOs who are driving the transformation is basically they need to manage the delta because what is discussed in the strategy level where this has been transferred to the functional team is where the delta comes in and. Uh, if this delta is not managed well, the things go in tangent, right? So that's where I was talking about the change management and organizational management part of it, right? And we see this uh, in the recent uh, McKinsey report. I was I was also browsing that cultural and behavioral change comes pretty much on the top of many organizations when they talk about industry transformation. Thank you very much, uh, CK. Um, yes. So in your introduction, you basically already. Uh, explain my ppt or my my slide deck here what i want to share today is about all about transformation how to build a factory of the future and you can already see and i experience myself now with all the new technology um, sometimes it's not so easy i think it's now the, the third laptop i try here to be online and, and live but um yeah so how, how do we do these kind of things in our plant um i want to share an example here factory of the future digitalization and leadership as transformation success factors and we try to do this here in asia pacific in our new plant um, which is about one year old now in vietnam and i take uh, i take you step by step now through what we have done so far and and what is our journey here um very shortly to to the company where i work for i'm the coo asia pacific i live in singapore for the last two years here we are a manufacturing company have about eighty-seven thousand people uh, working for us worldwide and 170 locations 50 countries and 75 plants which means we are a huge manufacturing company you can also see here the number 1.1 million ton of steel we are processing so we are pure manufacturing metal forming company, more than 10,000 products. And we are in the field of on the business divisions of automotive OEMs, where we produce systems components for engine system transmission, hybrid electrical drives, of course, now chassis systems. We do have an automotive aftermarket the, um, division for the products we have and others for the uh, after sales, uh, repair shops and so on. And we have a huge industrial division which is clustered in sectors here. You can see wind, uh, railway, two wheelers, industrial automation. So we started as a bearing company, but have metal components. Everything what's turning, moving is something we, we produce. And of course, the field of um, Industry 4.0 is interesting for ourselves, our manufacturing footprint, but also for the applications we produce and uh, the products we offer for our customers. And um, we bring more and more intelligence and software into our products. Um, to connect uh, things to get processed data. But this presentation today is not about our customers. This presentation more is our own factory of the future. How do we transform and why I do believe that digitalization alone will not make it. We need clearly focus on our leadership and that's why I call it digitalization and leadership as transformational success factors. So I think we have a simple recipe um, how to transform a plant. You can see here a, a screenshot uh, of our production system. You can see the suppliers on the left side. Then we go into a, 
um, incoming and incoming area we do stamping heat treatment grinding something we do assembly we have uh, other functions industrial engineering uh, laboratories tool services and then we go into um, jet or just um, outgoing areas to to our customers so that that's conventional what we have already uh, what is needed now to transform into a digital organization and you i, I put it here together it's all these things um we we hear and read and talk about every day it's 3d printing it's digital twins collaboration robots um, artificial intelligence digital services um, augmented reality smart devices so basically we take now our conventional footprint and we take now all the new technology the innovations the new ideas the software and we put it all into our existing mechanical and then conventional driven operations and we come to the factory of tomorrow so if we talk about factory of tomorrow then of course what we want to have we want to have connected all our machines we want to have connected the people um, real-time data um, machines talking to each other uh, autonomous plans um, paperless all these kind of things i think that's a that's a very common understanding how a factory of tomorrow can look like um, of course, then we have a cobot inside. We have AGVs. Um, uh, basically, a plant can drive it autonomous. We have machines who make smart decisions and so on. Um, but when we talk about that with our employees, uh, maybe the picture looks a little bit different. And I, I put here some notes. Um, we talk about big data, dev um, some devices, um, Industry 4.0. And on the other hand, we talk about transparency, new skills, escalations, observation, you know, transparency is good, observation is bad. Um, so do we need, what do we need for what? What do we need together? What uh, maybe here not aligned? Um, and these are all, all things which our, our employees very have questioning, um, have a high uncertainty. And you know about the VUCA world, um, this brings a lot of, a lot of uh, mixed feelings, I guess, to, to our workforce. Is my job uh, secure? Do I work in the same environment as tomorrow? What do I need to, to learn? And these kind of things. So again, when we come back to our, our big idea here of a factory of tomorrow, I think we need a clear vision, which we have and shown here in a, in a picture. We know we transform from today to tomorrow, where we are not so clear about this tomorrow at the moment. Um, this topic of OT security becomes more and more critical. Uh, we already have some solutions, but are these solutions the right ones? We need to, to start learning about digital technical details, um, IT skills. Yes, we had some in the past. I don't know if these skills are the right one for the future. And we already started with a lot of use cases and um, pilots. Um, I think every one of us has good examples and, and a lot of fun and, and enjoys these smart solutions. But what's really another success factor we, we cannot forget, and that's why I want, I want to show that in the next nine steps we have here put together, is the change management, the leadership transformation, um, the skills we need. Yeah, we, On one side, we say IT skills. Yes, we know the, how that works, but what kind of skills are needed for digitalization, algorithms, analytics, connectivity, and how will our leadership change in this environment? Definitely, we need to have a long-term view uh, we need to be agile on the other hand and we have no idea really where this long-term view will lead us so is this the final picture of our future plant here and um so these are these are all questions that i will guide you now with some um, nine steps i put together here how we started uh, the journey to come to a factory for the future i think the first one of the first things we need to have is a, is a clear digital strategy to give the direction for all our our activities and here we put in the middle of this digital strategy um, transparency transparency utilization digital empowered employees data-driven decision making um, there can be different versions of that i tell you in all our 75 plants in the Scheffler world this digital strategy looks always a little bit different because we have different product systems we have different um, supply chains business different um, markets but overall, the key message here, we have to have this clear strategy. And we put here the focus areas of people, uh, technology, processes, and data. So these are all um, vital ingredients which have to work together. 
um, to come to, to a future plant. Very important here is then our guiding principles, where we overall have a company vision and a division, a divisional or business visions and plant visions. Um, we have a Scheffler production system and we are focusing on reducing waste here. So all the things we do in terms of digitalization, we do not do and we cannot allow to do just because of digitalization and because we think it's uh, at the moment sexy and uh, a lot of fun. We need to create benefits here. We need to align this with our own long-term vision, which we have and which made us successful in the past. And we need to include here the people, the qualification, um, guidance, it has to be attractive for them. They need to feel the benefit. The technology cannot be there because of technology. If it does not add any value, um, maybe it's then the wrong technology for today for, for our plants. Which processes are we looking at? Um, how do we synchronize the processes? How do we connect them? And then last but not least, what do we do with all the data which we are collecting now? How do we transform data in value? and then the value and benefit for customer, supplier, and for, for our employees. Um, so that, that's a big guide, guiding um, starting point here, the strategy. And the next step then would be a kind of an assessment. And we call it digital and autonomous plant assessment to identify where we are. So here we put 10, 10 um, areas where we thought this is important. Um, everyone, you can, you can take 10, you can take five. It's, uh, I think it's just important that you have something where you measure against your strategy and against your vision of a future plant. Um, what is important? What do you think today is important? And then there's a questionnaire behind and how do we evaluate? How do we evaluate today our capability of data and analytics? How do we evaluate our culture to change from today's system into a digital autonomous factory for tomorrow? And so this is something we should do or we, we, we are doing every quarter to see how we are improving and also to see uh, the weak points here at the end. Uh, it's like a wheel, right? You need to you need to try to have it round, to have it smooth and all these things uh, work. It doesn't help you if you have a great digital shop floor, uh, state of the art, better than everybody else. But your organization and workforce has no clue how to use that digital shop floor management. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a very good tool for us here is these 10 success factors to make an assessment from time to time and to clearly identify the areas we need to work here in a team. As we are transforming, um, transformation has always something to do with change and then we look into change management. How do we motivate people? How do we take uh, uncertainty out of people's mindset? I think it's important to, to let them participate and experience and explore what, what's the benefit, what's happening. So we need to connect the change with a good good feedback here. And that's why it's here already on, on step number three for us, human-centered approach. Um, what is the experience or how do we let the employees experience the change, the benefit of digitalization, the personal benefit, but the benefit for the organization. And we put it here in, operations at the production line. Of course, these are the people who work in our in front of our machines who actually produce the parts, who decide um, how good is this part, uh, how to improve the process, and how to make us successful. Um, another area which is really affecting immediately is then documentation, the documentation process. We, we have to go to paperless. We need to use live dashboarding, reporting real-time data. Um, that's benefiting immediately to, to our employees. Let me jump to the left side training um, to set up their skills. Of course, the opportunities we have is virtual reality, augmented reality, digital labs, um, digital twins. It's a huge potential which can increase the experience for our people to develop themselves and to grow, um, which we cannot forget. And there's some areas where we need to be very fast to let them, um, yeah, to have them a share on the transformation immediately. The last point here, I put on the management to support the analysis. For sure, we, we want to use this data for decision making, for planning. But um, I come later to that, and CK, you mentioned that also in your uh, introduction here. We need to adapt our leadership style. And um, I have it later together, but I believe with the new transformation of our production systems, the speed, the clarity, and transparency, um, the leadership style has to change and has to adapt and, and be agile in, in the same way as we introduce new 
technology. Um, the next point then, what we created here, and this is something to visualize our, our vision um, in a more deeper way, is a target picture. Uh, and this target picture, in, in our case here, what when we start from the bottom, we take all our employees, we take the dif different um, departments here, and thinking about what, how do we connect them and what benefit do they have from digitalization? How, what benefit can they have by being connected to each of the machines, each of our suppliers and so on? Um, then we go more into a techni technical view here in our operator shop floor logistics. How do we connect these things? Um, do we have an AGB? Do we work with some real-time data? What kind of terminals we have? Um, what kind of systems we do and, and a little bit go into the infrastructure which we need actually uh, to make this happen um, because this picture also shows we do not want to work in single silo pilots you know to have one agv or to have one cobot somewhere in a line um, loading unloading a machine it is okay just to test the physical capability of, of a cobot but at the end we want to have a smart cobot talking to the machine and talking to industrial engineering um, giving information which helps us to get better and um, maybe also think about this connectivity to supplier and customers um, to tell them, okay, we, we finished that batch supplier, you can get ready. Um, we need some more, some more components or the customer, give him a real-time data uh, status of where is this production uh, now and how long does it take? So that's, that's something um, we, we want to show here. And then of course, when we go more upwards, we see our infrastructure, we need uh, some kind of gateways, um, which will enable us to connect and, and, and exchange here information. We come into a kind of a messaging broker system. Um, we call it our plant data center, where then our dashboard, our application widgets, all these applications run with other, other systems like existing MES systems or ERP systems, which we have. And then the next step would be we bring it into a global global cloud because I believe that's a real benefit. Think about you see here a, a machine. We have probably one kind of these machines. Um, maybe a 1,000 to 1,500 of the same type of machines in our world, in our global network. And real benefit comes then if we have all the data from all the same kind of machines um, in terms of um, condition monitoring, spare part management, uh, performance, uh, parameter settings. I think that's when we really come into a benefit of uh, digitalization. So target picture is very clear. On the other hand, this target picture is just a snapshot what we know today. Uh, maybe in three months we are um, faced with more innovation, more uh, technical possibilities, and we need to adjust this uh, target picture. So agility and, and willingness of change is still something we need to consider here. Um, so we talked about the, the strategy, um, where we are with our assessment, um, involvement of the people, yes, to experience change, our target picture. So now who is going to do it? And we see here um, something where we have to say, we need to adapt our organization, which also means we need new skills and new functions. Um, Let's say five years ago, I don't think that we talked about product owner, solution architects, data scientists, uh, connectivity technologists. Uh, and these are all new job descriptions and positions we, we create now, all of us here in this industry, um, to be able to handle what, what we need. There's new skills here, uh, which we have to implement into, into our organization. So definitely this, organizational setup of, a, of an organization of, of a plant um, has to change. We cannot proceed again here as, as what we have done in the last 10, 15 years. So once we have now the pain point evaluation, the strategy, the target picture, let's, let's move forward and go to execution. And we decided, because we have our long-term view here, we want to have a sustainable uh, best class plant here. We invest a lot of time into infrastructure, um, setting the, the basis uh, for our digital transformation means what are the servers and architecture, the LAN cabling, um, the networking, the access points. And at the moment we are spending really 
to the topics as our priority. And we spend a lot of money and a lot of time on that to do it, to do it right. We believe if we do the infrastructure and the connectivity here as point number two, a little bit slow, but more solid and, and then detailed. Um, then later we just accelerate on, ex, um, on utilizing the data we create here and are not hindered by not, um, not being connected in the right way or not having the right standard. So connectivity, for example, here, we use different uh, connectivity solutions. We benchmark a lot, but also as Schaeffler, we are developing or we developed our own gateways. We develop our own software based on our production system um, to be ready and, and to really have something which fits 100% to our production system. Uh, um, we do lose some time here. I have to clearly say there's a lot of gateways available at the market. Um, we come into topics of OT security, um, data points, capability, um, software definition. So that's why we made this uh, decision here to go into our own, own development. And then the next thing or parallel to that, we immediately start with the first use cases here of real-time data dashboard, as I said before, and I put this here with the, with the people in, in this picture. We need to let the employees and our organization experience the change, little changes. Um, dashboard is nothing new. Everybody has dashboards, but now connecting these dashboards, having real-time data, different views, being more flexible, that, that's a, clearly a small step of transformation, but it's important for us to have this hand in hand. And then afterwards we go into app development. Again, this is user oriented, uh, augmented virtual reality. And after that, step by step, single single solution. But uh, our recommendation and our experience we have right now here is really spend some time on the right infrastructure. Make sure um, you do, you're, you're sure that you don't need to change your infrastructure or your gateways or your connectivity model in six months because you forgot something. Um, that's why we spent a little bit more time here. Um, coming to the details, infrastructure and connectivity, how do we do that? And a really detailed view and um, basically what we, what we do, we take a layout where we see our, all our machines and then we zoom in and then we have a clear plan where our cabling, which sensors, which standard sensors are we using? which gateways we need in which position, not only today, because you can see there are some white spots in this layout, but also for tomorrow where we expect new machines coming. So Vietnam is a plant one year old, so we are still ramping up and um, adding more machines, adding more headcount. So we lay the infrastructure for the future um, for what we, we put the layout here in a very detailed, detailed way. And we're trying hard to defend this kind of um, forward moving, as, this is, as I said, it takes some more time, but at the end, we do have standard gateway server connectivity data points, which makes it at the end uh, much, much faster to, to what we want to do. Um, some other impressions, as I said, involve the employees. Here um, we put a screen wall, and the screen wall is where we can have different things. We, you see some, some data here, you see condition monitoring, but also the virtual reality, augmented reality um, topics here. It's a virtual uh, trainer, which we have, where really the employees can open a machine. We do set up time um, trainings or set up trainings, um, you know, handling trainings. So these kind of things are parallel, developed, but immediately put in the right place and always include the, the organization for that. And that's then also the fun part. I mean, this is also important, as I said, change management, you need to connect positive um, experience, positive experience uh, with our employees, uh, that they're not afraid. I mean, again, this uh, uncertainty, uh, we need to overcome by, by positive and ben by positive uh, feedback benefits. And they need to, they need to see a benefit out of that. Instead of working eight hours on a, on a simple line, doing uh, arm movement from left to right, no. Give them, trust them with new technology and let them develop it with us together. I think that's, that's a key point here. Um, last point I want to, to highlight and say, Key, that's, uh, see, okay, that's what you mentioned at the beginning, leadership development. And that's a crucial part. We, 
we don't talk too much about and when we go to fairs when we when we see something on linkedin all these great ideas um how do we implement this yeah we need to define i think a new leadership standards i put it here how do we act now how do we deal with transparency uh, in the past i give you an example uh, in a daily in a daily work we look at data from last last day there maybe was a quality issue there maybe was a machine breakdown and then we discuss about past data we look into the mirror to the back and and try to understand and act uh, but with the real-time data availability we need to make decisions now we need to understand immediately and we have to change because this data is, is available and now the organization needs to is it a blaming organization is it a proactive organization um, i think transparency does not be cannot become a threat for our employees um, it has to help us and we have to we have to uh, support um, the trust from our employees to work with transparency um, that proactively we don't lose the speed and we don't lose our our agility um, agility for leadership is also something we cannot stick to our plans anymore um, like we did in the past if you have an action plan in the past and you have 10 points we implemented these 10 points afterwards we try to look at these uh, success uh, or the results is it a success or not with digitalization um, the feedback is much more immediate so we need to accept that these 10 point plans might not work anymore we need to accept that we, we put two, three actions uh, in place. We get immediately feedback, and maybe it means that our set, uh, point three to, to 10 is not valid anymore. We have to find a new way. So this agility agility we need. Um, something very difficult maybe for us is uh, to trust smart algorithms. You know, when, when you're not happy with the, with the results, sometimes you question the mathematical model, but um, with algorithms, it's going to be an interesting discussion here uh, we have to avoid discussing that the algorithm might be wrong that um, there must be a, a mistake in that so how do we deal with that uh, we also face that you have um, young data analysts um, normally we live especially in, in production environment with people who have experience who've been on the machine who, who can tell us exactly what happens now there will be a new generation in our organization people from university just uh, uh, starting with with skills we need, I call them here done young data analysts. They have no clue about a production machine or grinding. They have no clue about mechanical performance of a of a uh, material. But what they know is what the data says and how to read the data and give us an idea um, in which direction we need to change the process. So we need to build some trust here as leaders and these young talents um, that we can make uh, decisions based on that. And uh, I can I can uh, do this here for another hour. What all has to change in our leadership development? Um, another point: what we what we found out and, and what we believe in, we have to find the right partners. Um, we cannot develop everything by ourselves. Uh, we need to speed. We need to speed up. We need to gain speed, and, and we call it here development collaborations. We have some partners in Vietnam, um, like FPT for programming for helping us. We have here with. Uh, CK now for, for some topics, some projects we start here. You need to find the right partners. I think this is a sharing uh, time, a sharing community, not only in experience, but also in yeah, uh, applications, uh, lessons learned. Let me sum up. I'm not sure about, about the time, but the original approach, what we had, and, and when we talk about this kind of thing, it's technical solutions. Uh, we spent 80% on, on that also in discussions and leadership discussions in the past um, also here on this conference maybe talk about technical solutions and ideas uh, less on leadership i believe uh, transformation to plan to the future factory of tomorrow we need to transform the production system we need to transform our operating system but we also need to transform a focus area and discussion points um, i believe it's it's going to be less on technical ideas we have that it will come anyway we cannot stop that anymore but we have to focus and uh, consciously go into dialogue with our employees with our leadership with our teams how do we do that and engage everyone and move forward so let's transform in this way um, 
my message is for you today and then later that's something we can discuss and we, we should discuss i'm interesting and to hear your experiences especially in in leadership leadership adaption here first of all we need to challenge our our digital ideas if they help us if they gave, if they bring benefit to our customers to our employees to our suppliers um, we need to think about different point of views here in regards of the VUCA world. Um, we as technology driven people or in, in the management, it's a different viewpoint as some of our employees might have with less experience. Um, they have different thoughts. We have to have an open uh, ear here. Um, we need to find the right organizational setup to empower the teams and to create this agility. It comes not automatically. Um, we need to build the trust here and we need to focus on people management. I always say at the change uh, 80, 20 to 20, 80. And at last but not least, at the end, every one of us here should, should have fun. Thank you very much again. Um, so I, as introduced, I'm Francisco Castillo. I'm, I'm usually called Kiko for short, K-I-K-O. And I'm from Mainilad Water Services, which is a water company in the Philippines. And uh, I will discuss a little bit about IoT as well as the convergence of IT and OT. And uh, I, I prepared a series of videos, short videos, so that you can actually see that um, what I'm discussing is actually a reality for us today. So just uh, very briefly, I will just, just one slide about who we are, and then I will share some of the projects that we've done. And then uh, maybe instead of benefits and challenges, I think uh, I'd like to discuss what other things moving forward we we plan to do so a little bit about mainilad water so mainilad water is a private company it has a it was granted a 25 year concession by the government currently it's the largest in the philippines and we serve water septage and sewerage services to around 9 million people in the west zone of Metro Manila and the neighboring province of Cavite. So we cover actually around 17 cities and municipalities which are part of the metro, the greater Metro Manila area. So um, you can imagine that uh, we cover really a, a very wide area and one of the challenges uh, in a water company, unlike, for example, in a factory, is that in bringing IoT, we're talking about having assets distributed all over the place, um, which gives some challenges in terms of communications uh, connectivity. But before I do that, let me talk about what IoT or Internet of Things means for us. Actually, this journey we started very long ago. We started way back in 2012, even before IoT became a buzzword. And the idea really was to capture data from all our sensors that we had in all our different assets. And that means in our pipes, in our reservoirs, dams, in our water treatment plants, in our sewage treatment plants, um, pumping stations, lift stations that are all over the place. The idea is to be able to store this information, this, this data, long-term, meaning years, but of a fine granularity, sometimes milliseconds, but usually seconds resolution. So that in a way, this is a, a repository of technical data that we can actually use for whatever purposes that may have. Um, at the same time, in 2014, we converged the OT and IT space under my uh, division. So I am lucky to, to be able to be in charge of, of both. Uh, this makes it easier because otherwise you see a continuous rivalry between the two. Um, and I always say, you know, the way that was possible to converge IT and OT is, you know, if it's under me, I can't argue with myself. So that's the simplest way to do it. Um, in this way, we can get all this uh, sensor data and actually feed it into the different IT applications that can use this data and make 
sense out of it. So I will show you a short video of how our IoT platform looks like. We call it the field mouse. So first you have a menu of displays and you have something like this, which is a dashboard, which shows uh, some of the key indicators. Say for example, the water level in our dam, If we click on that, we get actually the trend or we could see the water production in one of our plants. This is our largest or second largest plant, 924 million liters a day. And we can see the trends, right? Um, we could also see our, our losses, non-revenue water, as well as other information. If we also have a series of, of small maps which display the pressure um, along different um, areas within our concession. If you see green, that means it's good. If it's red, that means it has low pressure. There may be maintenance or possibly a leak. And we can actually even select specific subzones to see the, the pressure profile. So this, for example, is one area. And we can see in the last 14 days, the trend, we could change the scale, say we want to change it to one day, we can see the 24 hour profile. And if we click on that, we can actually uh, see details and we can actually go back in time. If you want to scroll to the left and see the historical of that, we can do that. Right. So this, this gives us a very rich source of information. We can actually even go to the plants. So this, for example, is a sewage uh, lift station. It's a series of, of pumping stations, pumping the sewage until it reaches the, the sewage treatment plant. And all this data is live. If we click on the level, we can see, sorry, let me just go back. We can actually see the, the level of sewage that was processed in the last so many hours or days as we wish. Um, we could for example, select a water treatment plant. Uh, this is one of our uh, newest water treatment plants. And we can see we have a dashboard here which summarizes the operation. We can see the level of the reservoir. We can see the production. We can see even the status of the filters, the pressure on each, um, and so forth. We can even see the, the, the chemical composition of, of the water, right? Um, and we can even select, let's say we go to one particular area, we say let's go to one filter. We could actually get the details of what is happening in, this is a microfiltration uh, filter in rack one, and we can actually see the characteristic. And each of these points is a dynamic point, meaning to say, if I click on it, I will get the trends, right? And, I, and, and it, all, those, all that information is stored long term. So a lot, a lot of information, a lot of screens, I, just to show you, uh, we have hundreds of screens with different information with thousands of sensors. And this is continuously expanding. So that, that was the, the first thing we did. We developed this platform for us to get all this information. Um, it's not just, monitoring and report but the idea is with that information we can actually optimize our operations and optimize the control so we also built a central control room which monitors these things and adjusts accordingly so this is a picture of our central control room it's a 24 by 7 uh, operations we have actually two control rooms for redundancy and they can actually uh, visualize everything that is happening in our water and sewerage network. Um, another example, this is a sewerage treatment plant. You can see the incoming sewerage. This is quite dirty water. And after it's treated, before it goes to the river, you can see it's of a very good quality. It's, it's transparent. What I wanted to highlight here really is that you can see here a bunch of sensors. This is a flow meter. We have a pH meter. We have a dissolved oxygen meter. We, we monitor many different um, chemicals 
that are in the water to ensure that um, before the water is discharged, it's of acceptable environmental standards. And these, these sensors are everywhere, are everywhere in, we have more than um, 200 or 300 plants of differing size. Uh, this is my team. They're calibrating the, the sensors because sensors also need to be regularly cal recalibrated. So, um, with regards to the convergence of IT and OT, um, we, we really see the advantage of that because we can actually use all this information, and these are the typical sensors that we have in the plant, and use that IoT data in order to feed different applications. And later on, I will show you some of the applications that we have developed in order to support the operations of our company. Uh, samples of these are, for example, reports, uh, simple reports. The, the screens I showed you earlier can also be accessed via an Excel plugin. And everybody in the company knows Excel. And usually uh, it's the preferred way of getting the data and analyzing. And our engineers have actually, are knowledgeable enough that once they get the data, they can actually develop their own applications, their, their own reports, their own analysis. Hydraulic modeling, uh, this is a core function in, in the water industry, wherein you model how your water network behaves. Um, detecting leaks, and I have a very good example later on. We, can, we also display the data on our maps, uh, our geographic information system, and linking that with customer data. I also have another example later on. But we also install sensors in our pumps, in our motors, such as vibration meters, um, temperature sensors, which give you a good idea of whether that particular asset is going to have a breakdown in the future if you don't do anything about it. So we actually implemented condition-based maintenance such that if a particular sensor uh, triggers a warning, it actually goes into our ERP and automatically generates a work order for inspection of the asset. And of course, operational alarms. Um, I mentioned one of the challenges is communications, and that means that we really make use of a very wide array of communication types. For the larger plants, we use fiber, but we have actually some very small facilities. For example, this is a pipe, which may be quite uh, distant from the plant itself, maybe a few hundred meters. So we also use industrial wireless to get the data back into the plant and then from there transmit it using fiber. We also have facilities such as this. This is a cage and inside is the, is the controller controlling pumps, valves and, and taking sensor information off of these pumps and the, the pipes that are actually under, underground. So this is a, an autonomous controller but we actually want to be able to get information from what is happening at the site and transmit that centrally to our central control room. So putting a fiber in many of these facilities that we have all over would be quite an expensive endeavor. So we were one of the pioneers to use 3G and GPRS. And this is a 3G or a GPRS modem that connects to our PLC cabinet and transmits that back to our central control room. So we have even smaller facilities that are just using SMS. At the end of the day, we use whatever is available and is economically uh, feasible. Um, so we have really many types of communication. I'll just give you another, another example. This is our geographic information system or map. Um, and I'll show you an actual demo. So the GIS maps, all our assets on the field. So if we zoom in, eventually our customers and meters will be displayed. Here you can see a customer in the, 
form of a premise in yellow, right? You can see the, the name of the customer and the meter with the little M. These are historical leaks. We can also see the characteristics of a valve and even the characteristics of a pipe. This is a tertiary pipe, it's PVC, and we can see the customers connected to it. We also did and we invested in aerial photography. Instead of using Google Maps or something similar, we actually undertook our own aerial photography because we all our assets are actually underground. So we need the very, very precise location of our assets before we dig, for example, to do refurbishment or to do maintenance. And we needed a sub one meter resolution, which we did not find available in the market. So that's why we resorted to doing our own aerial photography. Um, with something like this, we can see all our customers, our meters and pipes displayed, and we know where each customer is connected to, such that we know what affects the customer at each location in terms of pressure and flow along the pipes. Um, another example, this is a leak management application. By getting all this IoT data, flow and pressure data of our pipes, and correlating that with billing information, as well as our GIS, our map, we actually feed that into our water loss management software. And from here, we're able to get leak management reports. This actually tells us where leaks will most likely, are most likely occurring in our network. I'll give you an, uh, a real example. Um, we had a problem of a large water leak in near the port area in Malabon. And the initial assessment by our construction group was to replace that whole pipe segment. And that was going to cost $1.7 million. Um, our hydraulic engineers with the, with the use of these tools said, oops, let's wait a minute. Why don't we try and simulate and see where that leak is probably in our network? So the software identified an area where the leak would probably be. So what happened is that area was dug up and true enough, the leak was found there. The total spend for repairing that leak was 65,000 pesos or approximately $1,200 versus the $1.7 million. Just to prove that I'm not um, stretching the truth, this actually won a prize in London. This was the Bentley Systems B Inspired Awards in 2013. And this is our young hydraulic engineer picking up the prize on behalf of Mynila. So there was a huge benefit for the company. So as you can see, all this IoT and IT, OT endeavors are actually uh, not science fiction. They, they, they're existing today. This was in 2013. From 2013 to today, we've progressed even more. This is another example. We call it the automatic customer contact system. But actually, it's, it's more than a system. It's an, it's an integration of many different systems. Um, the idea is having the GIS or the mapping system as the central part. We can actually um, identify or program interruptions due to leaks or repairs that need to be done in our network by plotting them in the GIS. And um, through the central control room, um, doing that plot, getting that data available to the crews that are on the field using a tablet. Um, I'll just show you a demo again. And this is actually the IoT data, this overlaid on the GIS, so we can see the pressures, right? And whenever there is a maintenance that is to be done, the control room personnel map a polygon of that area that is going to be under maintenance. Uh, here in red, we see the ongoing, and in yellow, the one that is programmed. And we can see actually the details of the
the the work maintenance that has to be done including the duration what time it will last right we can see it here so what happens now is that within that polygon we can identify all the different customers that are affected we can see as we will see right this is one particular customer if we click around we can see the different customers affected so now we can extract all those customers and if we have a registered cell phone uh, automatically sms them and inform them proactively of the interruption in water as of today i would admit this is not fully automatic there's still it's still semi-automatic but uh, we're now doing the the next phase where all of this will be done in an automatic fashion so that uh, it goes through the parsing engine and automatically informs our customer as well as our um, uh, call center agents they can actually uh, access that and see what is the reason for having a low pressure in that area um that's all i wanted to share today uh due to the limited time um ck mentioned that i published this book um aside from it being available in in springer which is the german publisher um it's also available in some of the online bookstores including amazon we have a kindle version and some others and it really talks about how to manage uh, technology that that is really it doesn't talk about technology itself it talks about how to manage it here in this in this sessions we've discussed that the soft skills are so important and i really believe that uh, managing technology is not just like uh, managing anything else it takes special skills to do that so in case you're interested uh, please i would refer you to it thanks again ck so my name is prayukt i'm representing an organization called civix so we are a 25 year old organization we have been working with telcos all this while and now we have branched out into um, a cyber security space as well because all this while we are working very closely with telcos solving their key challenges in areas such as you know understanding the customer requirements and protecting them from all kinds of fraud so we use that background of ours to venture into cyber security and we we started with iot and ot and now we have you know branched out and we are covering everything uh, that is cyber security uh, as of today and to uh, tell us a bit uh, about ourselves without bragging much uh, today we are a global company present across all the livable continents we've got active deployments going everywhere else we have been ranked as the best uh, or the you know uh, the best iot security platform of the year 2019 uh, by compass intelligence which is one of the biggest analyst groups in north america actually and uh, 2020 is here so we are waiting for some more uh, 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 laurels to come our way so while we wait for them just to let you guys know today we run the largest honeypot network uh, in the world by that i mean that we have the largest threat intelligence gathering facility uh, available in terms of iot as far as iot is concerned operational as of today in 62 cities and the kind of data we are collecting from these honeypot networks is what i am presenting in front of you today and uh, I, I hope this will be insightful for you as much as it is for us because we are seeing some very interesting action that's been happening for the last four or five months since this COVID-19 uh, set in actually. Just some of the ecosystems by be secure. Uh, industrial IoT is right up there. And I'll tell you the reason why we are so excited by the challenges that industrial IoT is uh, posed so far moving forward so what has changed in the last five months this is the this is the question that we keep on getting uh, asked very often because we were one of the first cyber security vendors to come out and say that uh, this particular pandemic is not just uh, something that is affecting us as, as people or our health but this is also affecting us in cyberspace as well so very early on as early as Feb uh, of this year we were able to see certain COVID-19 team that attacks that were, that had started taking place in isolated pockets around the world. And uh, by these attacks, what I mean is that there were a lot of phishing mails that have been sent to employees of organizations telling them that, you know, there are COVID-19 kits, PPE kits being distributed for free and things like that. They were ma masquerading as government uh, communication and diplomatic communication and whatnot. And uh, they were, you know, luring these employees of some organizations including leading manufacturers 
to actually click on them and download uh, malware so that is how this story actually this narrative started and things really uh, went downhill from there onwards so as everyone speaks about the new normal in terms of social distancing in terms of you know work from home and everything else we have a slightly different take on everything uh, that is happening as of now so we are starting with something called as a deflective attacks that are taking place on manufacturing which basically is that uh, manufacturing as a sector is getting attacked not as a primary target uh, but what what really is happening is hackers are targeting manufacturing so that the cert and other teams which are involved in cyber cyber defense at a national level for a country are you know occupied with these attacks so what they do is all the resources that are involved in cyber defense are kept tied up while they start scouting for uh, attacking other pieces of critical infrastructure there is targeted communication manipulation or at scales that we have never seen before as i said uh, people are masquerading as government agencies the world health organization they are issuing advisories with uh, you know uh, with links which are embedded in links which are uh, you know which on on clicking them or accessing them will lead to download of ransomware malware and what not then this is the most worrying part that you know the coordinated attacks cyber attacks have risen 41% so what do i mean by coordinated attacks basically earlier we used to see certain groups which were you know which were very much focused on attacking industrial infrastructure but today we are seeing a lot of these groups working together uh, to effect a breach and uh, there were there was lot of new actors who have joined in in the last 5 months lot of uh, hackers who were not really a uh, very active uh, in the last 2 to 3 years have gotten active now as part of larger groups that uh, they have become affiliated with and this is definitely a worrying development that that really is uh, you know a matter of concern for us and and look at the next point there which is that more attacks were logged in the three quarters of i mean more than more attacks were logged in the first quarter of 2020 than the three quarters of 2019 put together you know that's a telling statement again there to indicate that you know how what's the scale of attacks that that we are seeing this is completely unprecedented a lot of people have been taken off guard but we we were one of the few players who had anticipated this uh, this spike and i'll tell you why on that and southeast asia has become a very active zone uh, all players i mean i guess almost about 30% of all the apt which is the uh, you know state sponsored the uh, hacker groups that we are monitoring are active in this particular zone actually there is a lot of data that's been exfiltrated a lot of breaches that are happening a lot of companies are getting affected and they are not even aware that you know a breach has taken place so you know this this is a very tough time for all of us not just in terms of our health and everything else and physical well being but also in cyber space these concerns which are connected with what they call the new normal have not even been understood uh, to the fullest extent right so as we go along we'll see more uh, you know uh, more matters of concern uh, uh, come to the fore so this is what we did in feb uh, as early as the first week of feb we were seeing certain patterns of communication taking place uh, through our intelligence that we used to gather from all sources including the dark web so there was a lot of planning activity going on amongst hackers uh, they were regrouping and grouping again as i said new hackers were been recruited so obviously there was a lot of planning and action going on in the background while governments and everyone else were really busy uh you know fighting this pandemic and understanding how this things are going to uh you know pan out in the future and this is way before the lockdown started uh, this is way before some countries even had their first uh, cases been reported so look at how early these hackers have really jumped into uh, this particular space so there's a lot of planning that's gone in lot of foresight and we are of the opinion that the kind of sophistication that these hackers have shown indicates that you know these are professional level uh, uh, hackers and and beyond as well and there's a lot of state sponsored uh, hackers who have also joined the fray now in a big way and they are attacking industrial deployments for various reasons as we go ahead so as as that line mentions there that you know there's a high level of adaptability that uh, these hackers have shown in terms of not just understanding the behavior of people who they are targeting but also the behavior of the management and Uh, uh you know the responses that uh, that are going to come in from these companies and entities that are getting uh, targeted so the the days of psychological operations and psychological manipulation is long gone the days of social engineering are gone now we are gone on to this new normal as we would also like to call it uh, for now for want of a better jargon uh, this new normal is 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 going to come and haunt us in the near future because the hackers have 
really increase the gap between us and them and and they are right now winning the arms race like never before so these are matters of concern and uh, look at the first point there in terms of the major trends that we have seen that in the past you know we used to see a major manufacturer experiencing some form of breach uh, once every 8 weeks today that has come down to 2 weeks and these are just the reported ones that we have, we have been monitoring in the last uh, you know almost 90 days we can say and uh, you heard of how a major auto uh, maker was uh, breached in the recent past and nowadays there is so much panic in certain sectors that you know uh, people have shut down operations uh, entire assembly plants have been uh, shut down for people to really relook at their security strategies because they have some of them have really understood how close uh, uh, you know this this particular problem really is to them manufacturing associations have been targeted for information there was a major association in the us which which was targeted so that you know they could get the database of people who are involved in Uh, managing the security for some of these uh, top manufacturers out there and again look at the number of mal malware variants that have been detected 68% so what really is happening here is that they are not in investing in building new malwares there is some investment that's going on but the focus is on building newer variants of existing malware right so what happens is your cycle is reduced you can have more variants created per week uh, than you know if you are to invest in building a new malware altogether so they want to really have or rather exploit the situation to the maximum the situation as in the confusion that covid-19 has really created and uh, you know affect these breaches faster and this is something interesting that the attacks are up uh, the breaches are up but the leaked data the stolen data that that uh, they have taken from uh, these companies and you know entities that have been targeted have not shown up to the extent it should really show up in on the dark web so what does this mean so we would like to say that what this means clearly is that they are holding on to that particular data uh, they have not really uh, released it because they are very confident that you know they this they can extract lot of uh, uh, you know ransom from the entities who have been breached in the near future and definitely this data is going to show up sometime in the future this could also mean that the entities who have been breached or you know where successful breaches have happened are not even aware that they have been breached again a big matter of concern for all of us so in terms of manufacturing specifically what are the real challenges that that we are seeing uh, uh, which is you know led to this situation so there is lot of geopolitical instability uh, there are lot of law and order issues that have popped up in some countries uh, because of covid-19 uh, you know playing a factor in the background then you have ec availability of ot equipment on e-commerce sites so which means that they can really do their uh, you know digital surgeries on these equipment to figure out what kind of vulnerabilities are there associated with them hackers can order ddos attacks like everything is available on demand now uh, on the dark web and certain forums where these uh, uh, hackers congregate you can order specific tailored customized attacks you know in fact they even come and suggest if you have, if you have a certain ransom uh, uh, that you want to sort of extract then they'll tell you which segment should you be going after and they will set it all up for you for a certain uh, uh, you know percentage of revenue share or some other model that they are working together on then they are also creating lot of variants faster they are designed to you know uh, evade these existing systems which are based on signatures alone uh, they are they are trying to evade them by creating newer uh, malware you know newer sorry variants which are not really easy to detect again and convergence of iot and ot as francisco uh, rightly mentioned so many opportunities but on the other side it has created lot of cyber surface area for these cyber uh, attacks and last point of course cyber hygiene uh, that's something that you know can never be over emphasized because like you know sometimes in situations like covid-19 and beyond people really uh, don't focus on following these basic cyber hygiene rules because they are confused they are anxious or they might be under some kind of pressure or they are working from home and uh, you know they are not in monitored environments and things like that and you know your ability to uh, uh, you know be part of a compromise increases again so if you look at the way this this entire uh, chain works as far as infections are concerned they are using your own equipment infrastructure uh, your data and your people against you that's the way uh, they are seeing all this as so in case of the deflective attacks as i mentioned earlier where in manufacturing is a decoy target they are really using the manufacturing sector itself as a uh, as a catalyst for 
uh, you know performing a larger attack on the economy of a country especially when you're talking about state backed hackers and lot of intellectual property has really exchanged hands in the last 60 days a uh, lot of it uh, must be considering uh, must be have must have lots to do with manufacturing and a lot of it has to do with healthcare as well specifically we have seen and heard our intelligence team tell us that lot there's a lot of covid-19 vaccine related data uh, that that has been compromised again you know so that certain countries or certain actors or certain agencies can get a head start on really getting this uh, uh, this information and get their own uh, you know covid-19 vaccine uh, development efforts uh, into high gear and just today morning we we saw a very interesting data there in terms of certain labs which have just popped up in the last 3 to 4 weeks with absolutely no background in biotech or vaccine development actually talking about clinical trials reaching the large large scale uh, so you know that's that's really interesting again we 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 could be wrong there but we also have reasons to believe that at least few of these players might have something to do with these ip compromises that have really happened through the malware that you know these sophisticated hackers uh, have really deployed and also to talk about the surface attack the the surface area that has grown incredibly in the last few years ever since this converged environment has come into the picture so the attackers now have so many options to really take things you know take data and everything else out of your infrastructure like never before so now they can plan they can execute they may even be aware of surface areas that you may not be aware of they may be aware of devices that you are not discovered yet they may be aware of open ports that you may not have really closed after you did your initial round of uh, proof of concept or some other uh, you know go live that you done for an iot deployment for instance so everything is really adding up and this covid situation has really added another uh, force multiplier for these hackers uh, to really exploit so they have gone everywhere they have used it to the best extent possible so as i said in the coming days we will really know what's the full impact of uh, this breach again the advanced persistent threat actors who are who are more or less state bank who are extremely sophisticated again uh, these are the kind of targets they have really gone after a intellectual property diplomatic communication they wanted to know what the governments were doing how were they dealing with covid-19 and its fallout what kind of numbers were these governments circulating internally uh, and things like that economic data in state advisories drone feeds again i mean you would you would be wondering why why are they after again they wanted to probably check uh you know what kind of uh, what's the economic activity happening in key cities for instance of a certain country uh, covid-19 numbers antivirus logs so from all the 43 apt groups that we were targeting as many as 39 were active uh, in the last 90 days again that's very interesting like that those are very high numbers to see which obviously means a lot of these guys have got lot of work on their hands and maybe even subcontracting some of this work to you know uh, apt groups which are just coming up the curve and in terms of the sectoral attacks if you notice manufacturing is right up there again uh, it's not as much as healthcare because healthcare obviously for various reasons has been targeted extensively in the last 9200 days but manufacturing is really up there as probably the next uh, sector that that is that is attracting the maximum number of attacks so if you notice these are all part of the overall trends that like apt groups for instance have different motives there are other hackers with different motives but they are all converging on sectors like healthcare and manufacturing healthcare again for various reasons manufacturing primarily for ip and to ensure that you know uh, the disruption continues into the foreseeable future also that might be another incentive uh, that these hackers have for continuing uh, uh, you know continuously uh, targeting these entities and look at that number there in the bottom that is 13.3% of all stolen data on dark web is from manufacturing entities again these are conservative numbers uh, it, it might be more it could be it could be really higher than this and in the future this might see a huge jump as all the breach uh, data this more stolen data which the hackers are holding on to is released on to the dark web and it's not going to happen in in the, in the next uh, year or so but it will happen in the next couple of quarters that's the way we are seeing it because sooner or later even after these entities pay up these ransoms that have been asked for there is no guarantee that they will not go ahead and release this information or sell this information to some other uh, hacker groups you know there is that kind of trade also happening out there 
and at the end of the day it is all about making money for some of these hackers so you know they wouldn't mind selling it over and over again and some of them might end up uh, releasing this data on the dark web just some of the sample uh, uh, you know emails that we intercepted uh, where you know which you're talking about you know we'll give you a particular kit or something and then you know you can uh, really use this kits to protect yourself you have to download this particular attachment uh, sign it up digitally and send it back to who again obviously these are fake mails uh, these are again mails intended to create uh, a sense of urgency in the employees and then you know uh, take them down uh, take the organizations they are connected with uh, down through you know encrypting their data and asking for a ransom uh, to begin with so again the question that needs to be asked by all of us or rather answered by all of us is can we afford a breach at this point in time or any other point in time for that matter right now the costs are really increasing and uh, the hackers are really going after the money like anything so if you notice the way it is the ransom amounts and average ransom amounts have grown it is almost at 7 million usd uh, in in as of today as things stand it's going to go up as we go ahead even if you're talking about cyber insurance or any other underlying cover that uh, manufacturers can take to evade these situations i don't think we are in a situation now where you know and even an insurance cover can guarantee that the amount of ransom they are asking for can uh, be met with again uh, but another interesting aspect which i mentioned below there that cyber security investments are rising but the actual capex and opex is not which basically means that some of the investments or some of the so called investments are going into like you know fixing uh, a, a a setup after fixing the infrastructure after an actual uh, hack has taken place or an actual breach has taken place which is again worrying uh, because you know that's not really a cyber security investment if you are uh, spending a, uh, you know your uh, your money allocated for cyber security into putting your systems back in place so you know these are the kind of dichotomies again we are seeing uh, they are not forced but then again if we follow certain measures that i am going to outline in the next few slides we can avoid these kind of situations and uh, you know not be part of this particular statistic that we are seeing uh, right in front of us so what really lies ahead where are we going from here onwards uh, that's a question that that again we have, we have tried to answer here so the first wave of attacks got over as of may and right now we are in the middle of the second wave of attacks uh, that that have, that are taking place as as we speak so first wave again lot of sophistication was there lot of these attacks materialized in terms of ransom for uh, these hackers so they have taken all that money that they've got and they've invested in building better malware and going after much more many more industries and uh, manufacturing plants which are coming uh, you know online after these lockdowns have been lifted so the average cost of breach again it's going to go up phenomenally this year because since the hackers have put in lot of effort they are definitely going to make sure that they monetize these attacks then again covid-19 research is is been stolen uh, with increasing uh, this thing and there is lot of as i said increased apt action the state back uh, state back hackers are also uh, part of a lot of these breaches that are taking place for various reasons including geopolitical tensions that we are seeing right now in in lot of regions across the world so you know that is adding to the confusion and that's creating way more problems because these actors are not really after the money but they want to sort of send a geopolitical message to a certain state uh, by you know attacking their facilities a breach discovery will increase significantly because as the lockdowns are lifted uh, and people come back to work and you know uh, they connect their machines back into monitored networks and you know the attack chain gets completed there is definitely going to be some disruption or some kind of a ransom demand that will pop up at the moment uh, you know uh, uh, the, the ransomware is executed and and the data gets logged so a lot of these instances are going to come to the fore in the next 90 to 120 days and yeah 2020 is going to be the costliest year if it already hasn't been uh, we 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 can't even predict or forecast what's the kind of numbers that uh, you know we'll have to worry about as the year comes to an end because it's it's going to be a tiring year for everybody involved in in cyber security uh, it's not a year that we would want to see a repeated ever again uh, because you know it's drained us on multiple fronts uh, and then the last thing of course is that it's going to be a costly year for all of us as well that's that's not working out for anyone and attacks on critical infrastructure to intensify there have been lot of deflective attacks there have been lot of 
uh, sample attacks that have been carried out on airports and other facilities which are under shutdown for a while again we don't we don't have data in terms of how many of these uh, you know attacks have succeeded so only after these uh, you know uh, infrastructure facilities open up and start functioning to their full uh, uh, capacity it would be realized what has really gone wrong and stolen data will eventually turn up on dark web no doubt about that so you know whatever if if uh, you know some of these entities are thinking that if we pay the ransom and then we'll be safe no that's not going to be the case because they might still release this data again so what what is it we can do so all this while i've you know outlined the the problem so what is it that we can do to really uh, tackle this uh, this problem head on you know because we don't really have much time now because as i said the second wave has started we are in the middle of the second wave right now and we don't even know what kind of action will take place in the third wave so it's only fair that we start working towards addressing these existing problems uh, that that are there privilege marking again uh, the the credential related accesses that we are providing to a lot of people in the industries in the supply chain segment everything has to be relooked at you have to make sure that you know there are uh, the the privileges that are associated with certain accounts have to be minimized and they have to be really revisited now in the uh, covid scenario tackle suspicious payloads at the network level through deep packet inspection again that needn't be said it is something that has been often discussed but there's not much uh, that has happened we need to move faster on this because network is where we are seeing a lot of breaches taking place and that's where the action really is and regular checks on ensure uh, to ensure integrity of endpoints again in lot of instances uh, we are seeing that some of the manufacturers are not even aware of the kind of devices uh, that are existing on on their networks again not a good place to be in we need to make sure we are aware the situation awareness is at the highest level is of the highest levels and that we are aware of every single endpoint that is connected and what's really happening at that endpoint and with the data that's it's generating or it's exchanging Uh, through the network again supply chain poisoning a big big problem that has popped up with a lot of backdoor uh, you know trojans been embedded in some of the hardware being sold by certain entities around the world a uh, big big matter of concern so there has to be proper audits uh, that have to be done to establish a chain of trust to make sure that you know supply chains don't get poisoned and that you know there is no hardware that comes into your uh, it environment or ot or Uh, iot environment that can serve as a you know trojan horse for everyone else to or these hackers to uh, you know enter your network on and code sign offs to cover third party dependencies like in some instances like iot for instance it's 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 become so complicated that there are so many relationships at a platform and an application level for instance that it becomes very difficult to do a code level sign offs uh, that are there especially for third party uh you know applications for instance where there are multiple vendors for instance involved but these are part of a basic cyber hygiene mandate that we have to uh, implement and we have to go ahead with and just a few more things um, you know risk and threat modeling again you have to do there has to be disaster recovery drills to cover every scenario including the worst possible one of a complete plant uh, shutdown uh, ensure that the safety and you know security of employees is also taken the consideration <coughs> i'm i'm sorry there's some disturbance okay so we had to deploy tools to recognize vulnerable malicious logic for complex manufacturing machines again with this more and more complex uh, you know uh, machines been added every now and then the ecosystem itself becomes uh, way more complex and the interplay between these machines and the network and the devices and every other part of your uh, you know Uh, asset ecosystem is not fully understood the, those are not things that we can afford to at this point in time have regular conversations on cyber security internally and externally of course you don't have to reveal everything with to everyone but of course make sure that your employees are sensitized on cyber security requirements at all times right and then there is a, a attack deflection like use honey pot so that you know they don't attack you uh, they attack the attacks are uh, you know deflected to a setup that is that mocks your it or iot or ot or a combined environment converged environment out there so that you know you can not just protect your assets but also see the kind of attacks that are taking place in the manner that we study these uh, attacks as well and last but not least we are always there you can always talk to us since we are the ones who have you know really we have raised the alarm so obviously we have solutions to uh, fix these problems uh, to begin with and we have always believed in partnering and collaborating with all entities irrespective of their affiliations and uh, you know their interests 
as far as solving these problems are concerned. So today we are working with governments, we are working with industry bodies, we are working with actual industry players, we are working with uh, academic institutions in places like Singapore, and we are very happy to you know have these conversations with you to you know even look at areas like threat uh, modeling and taking this whole resilience uh, format forward. So this is a bit about us. I'll, I'll quickly conclude. Uh, this is all that we offer uh, for all entities, strategic areas that we cover. We have a solution. We do gap assessments and vulnerability assessment. We give SOC as a service, security operations center. We can set it up for you. Uh, then we also have threat intelligence, the largest honeypot in the world. We can set up a similar facility for you so that you can deflect these attacks and also study these attacks while we while you are there. And we are one of the few players that has got segment focused uh, threat intelligence repository. Like for manufacturing, we have uh, a specific you know inventory of uh, malware that that we used to see or the, whose signatures we used to identify the malware that are focused on manufacturing, for instance. And just some of the scenarios that that are associated with these attacks, you know, again very complicated. But at the end of the day, everyone is vulnerable. It's not just the data; it is also the people who are who are connected. It's also the employees who are at uh, uh, risk here because a lot of these malwares are targeting the safety and security systems that are deployed on the shop floor. And again, uh, this is our solution, not what exactly it does. More important than everything that it does is that is the kind of protection it gives for these environments that I just spoke about. There's there are, there's a three level detection framework that we have, which is again so that you know we don't miss the malware at any any single level. Overall, uh, we have got one of the largest threat research teams that is operating today in the industry, and we are people who are very focused on manufacturing as a segment and OTS again as an enabling technology, OT and IoT for instance. And we can, you know, really work with you to model your risks, and then work towards addressing those uh, those risks and lowering them. Be it from a compliance perspective, be it from a business continuity perspective, be it from ensuring that your stakeholders continue to, uh, you know, trust you uh, and and every action that you're taking to secure your uh, facilities. Again, our coverage includes everything from scenarios, the vectors, and the adversarial groups. We are one of the few. Uh, again, uh, companies which keeps a track on the hacker groups which are out there and which are operating to destabilize certain segments, for instance. You know, some of them are very focused actors. So we cover everybody. As I mentioned before, we have seen how many APT groups are uh, actually operational. APT groups are very hard to detect, but we have the capability to detect them uh, as well. And again, our protection extends to everything. And uh, so you can always come to us and see how we can help you uh, solve this out. So I'll end on that note. I hope uh, this year isn't as dangerous as uh, we are thinking it will be. Uh, we are ready to collaborate. We're ready to work with all of you. And in case you have any doubts on anything that you have seen today, please feel free to reach out to us. We have threat reports. We have got weekly updates that we share. We can always uh, pass those on to you so that you get a better awareness uh, uh, in terms of what's happening around you and what you can do internally or externally to uh, protect yourself. So thanks a lot again for having me. Thank you, CK. And, and cybersecurity is a continuous journey. It's not something we can done once and done forever. It's a continuous journey. It's going to be more complex. As I mentioned that government agencies across the region, especially in Singapore, cybersecurity agency or IMDA are actively driving the initiatives under the master plan for OT specifically the infrastructure or, or in US you talk about NIST or, or Europe about, about NISA. So cybersecurity is something, uh, and that's why uh, all these and SUPEX decided to be partner as well, uh, addressing uh, these challenges in Southeast yeah. Asia, because we know uh, uh, this region uh, is going to uh, drive a lot of such initiative in critical infrastructure manufacturing, while they may be lagging behind, but I think Southeast Asia, I did a survey on LinkedIn, is one of the, the forward looking region, which will drive a lot of businesses uh, uh, for many, even the US and European companies focusing on. Uh, like everybody talks about now 5G, which is a, which is a big topic mm. for telcos. Uh, so, I think, uh, uh, it's, while the question is for clause, but I think applicable for you also Francisco, uh, that what do you see 5G opportunities in your sector in manufacturing for clause as well as in your energy and utility sector if i can say and water services of 5g i'm sure who want to pick up first 
Yeah, so so let me answer. So first, this presentation was a little bit more on leadership and transformation, not so much on technology details. So 5G for us is a definitely yeah. a, a topic. Um, as I said, in different regions and different plants, we have different testing areas. So 5G at the moment, we implementing in Korea, where our digitalization footprint is a different one. We have more AGVs, we have more cobots, we are more into machine to machine data transferring. And that's where we see the benefit of 5G. Um, once we are in Vietnam at the moment, we are up, uh, building up the plant and filling with machines and filling um, with people. It's not necessary yet, but I'm sure we will come to that point where when we start that AGVs, um, logistics, external, internal, uh, so, so if the data mass volume goes up and we need more real-time data, then this definitely is a, is a hot topic for us. But not for Vietnam at the moment. It's more in the in, in, in Korea where, where we test. Sure. Uh, what we'd like to add, Francisco, on the topic five G. Yeah. Well, five uh, G is a promise, right? I mean, it's a promise of very fast uh, internet connection and communications. And and uh, the real question with with many of the telcos is what is that killer application that needs five G, right? Uh, unfortunately, my personal opinion is that IoT is not it, because if you look at the amount of data, again, it depends on your architecture and depends on the sector, but generally speaking, amount of data that you transmit is actually very small, right? So, I mean, we're happy with 3G and, and, and GPRS. It's actually sufficient. The bigger challenge really with, with wireless is availability because sometimes it goes down. So the reliability is not always there, especially in this part of the world, although it has improved dramatically, I would say. Yeah. Maybe I'll pick up some thoughts from Pariyuk as well from the 5G security point of view. And I know uh, Subex is also working on quite a number of such initiatives, helping Telco to be rolling out secured 5G. Would like to add and comments on, on those 5G initiatives? From yes. Cybersecurity. Definitely seek it. So uh, for us, what, what is really changing is that uh, if you look at the kind of deployments that 5G is really enabling, uh, the entire architecture really changes, right? So there again, you know, new surface areas emerge, for instance, and there is a lot of scope for lateral movement of malware, as we call it, which is basically the malware jumping across layers. So that again requires some level of sophistication to uh, engineer and re-engineer a malware to, you know, do those kind of uh, you know, make those kind of jumps, for instance. So we are already seeing from our threat intelligence, we are seeing that there is a lot of, uh, you know, movement from the develop malware development side towards that kind of achieving those kind of requirements, you know. So they are gearing up for 5G. That's the way we'd like to see it, you know. So what mm -hmm. probably is driving them is that they want to reach there faster than we, you know, bring and deploy these use cases. Like say connected cars were hacked even before you know, they became mainstream I and mean, they have to become mainstream in that sense. But you see, you know, these breaches taking place even before uh, they are deployed. So that's what we are going to see with 5G as well. Uh, but having said that, I guess it's going to be a game changer in so many ways for you know so many industries. That's where we see it. So having said, said that, if the security is taken care of from the blueprint stage itself, I don't see any reason why it should become such a huge matter of concern. Because on the positive side, it does enable a lot of industries to do more on the security side as well, right? Because you get those inside way more faster. You get that, that, you know, you can deploy your threat intelligence in seconds, you know, so that even if it's real time, it's more than real time. So that's the way we see it. So we are definitely uh, excited uh, by that. Thing. You know, I think interesting way to look at it, uh, as you said, the 5G will also help uh, security responses to be much faster and, and better uh, set up. Let's, let's give a round of applause to all those speakers. So sparing their time, uh, it was wonderful. And just to summarize, just one thirty last second for everybody. Any call for action would you like to leave with all those participants and the attendees who are listening, or even because this session will be recorded and will be shared, maybe the edited version on public also. So you won't be just viewed or listened now. You will be listened to later. So presuming that somebody will be also listening to you later. Any call for actions for those viewers also you would like to leave with. So maybe we'll start with the same rundown. We'll go with clause first. Any any message you'd like to give back? 
I mean, as I said, we need we need partners. Uh, we need we need to go this journey together. Uh, is it in in, in sharing uh, experiences, ideas, innovation? If it's in uh, finding the right talents, and cooperating, collaborating in projects. So please feel free um, to access uh, to to get in contact with us. Is it in Singapore or in Vietnam for the plant? Um, and and um, we are open to we are open to partnerships and and developing the future together. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Klaus. And over to you now, Francisco. Well, I, I always like saying this because you know, uh, in the technology field, there's a lot of hype, so it, it's actually quite dangerous. And now IoT is somehow in that hype, but I would I would recommend to please look at at the business, the business need because it is just one of the many tools out there to resolve a business need so that it has to start from there it cannot start from a technology point of view so the business must drive a problem that can be resolved in whatever and if iot is the solution then go for it yeah makes sense in fact miss as is old saying a problem well defined is a problem half solved so if you focus on the That's problems right. in the use yep. cases I think there's a dearth of technology to address them and, and a lot of good technology partners to address them. So last comment from, from your side, from Subek's side. Yeah, sure, CK. Thanks. So I'd just like to end by saying that, see, at the end of the day, this is your story. Uh, this is what is going to define you. So make sure that you write the story and don't allow anyone else to do that job for you. Because there's always a difference between an autobiography and a biography. In autobiography, you get to you know go you know escape with a lot of lies. <laughs> in a biography, it's somebody else in control. So a, a hacker is just trying to write that story for you. So don't allow him or her to you know, or don't grant them that privilege and uh, to do that. So be in control of your story, no matter what you do. I mean, just make sure that cybersecurity is one of your priorities. That's all I'd like yeah, to. Well, yeah. Wonderful message. And with that, we are. Kind of end of the session like i said this is the longest session we have posted quite a number of them uh, but very engaging uh, very insightful and i would like to thank again one more time to Claus, francisco and Pariyukth for sharing the insight with us and with all the partners